Today on the future of everything, the future of health and law. The first thing many people think about when they think about how law and health intersect is malpractice. Physicians getting sued because patients feel that they've suffered because the physicians did not provide appropriate care or did not deliver it in an appropriate way. Indeed, this is an important area of the intersection between legal world and healthcare world, but there's much more. What are the best ways to regulate health insurance? What should we expect of our health insurers? How can we ensure that drugs and medical devices are safe and effective and get to patients in a timely manner? How can we create rules to guide the advertising about these drugs and devices so that people are aware of them, but we don't unduly influence their use? How do we guide biomedical research so that it is performed ethically and with full consent of patients? How do we define the rules for sharing patient data so that we, we can benefit the healthcare system while also respecting the privacy of the participants? And how do these relationships all change in the era of the internet, digital devices, and social media? These issues all demand kind of a balancing act between the needs of individuals, the patients, the needs of the business concerns and the industrial players, and of course the needs of society at large, particularly the government, which serves as a major payer through government healthcare payment systems, and also as a regulator. Professor Michelle Mello is a professor of law and medicine at Stanford University. Michelle, you have addressed many of the issues at the intersection of law and health, and one recent issue that you've published about is the attitudes of clinical trial participants towards sharing their personal data. How did this issue come to your attention, and what did you find out about data sharing? Well, there has been a real movement within science to make sure that we get every possible bang for the buck that we spend on biomedical research. So there's been a push by funders of biomedical research, by the journals, and many other forces to, to make sure that scientists are sharing their data with other scientists. There's been a sort of a backlash within some quarters, though, about the implications of that move for patient privacy. And a lot of that... Um, uh, opposition has been voiced by the pharmaceutical companies that sponsor a lot of clinical trials. They typically couch their objections in terms of wanting to protect the participants in their clinical trials. But it wasn't clear to me what those participants actually want because no one had ever asked them. I see. And so what did you do about that? That. Um that gnawing feeling that you had that this might not be the whole story. We surveyed 771 current or recent clinical trial participants in three academic sites across the country. We wanted to know how they felt about expanded access to their participant level clinical trial data and what they perceived as the risks and benefits. And overall, were they willing to engage in that practice having already volunteered for the clinical trial? And, and what did they say? What surprised me was how overwhelming the support for this practice actually is among people who have volunteered for clinical trials. So specifically the practice of sharing the data. Of sharing the data. And what we're talking about here is not sharing results. Of course, everybody wants results to be made available. We're talking about sharing the participant level data after their name and certain other identifiers have been removed. And we asked them about a variety of people that might receive this data from other drug companies to academic scientists to members of the public who might be able to download it in a variety of ways in which it would be used. And 82% of the sample felt that the positives associated with all these types of data sharing outweighed the negatives. Only 8% had a negative view. 93% were willing to share their own data with scientists in academic settings and 82% with scientists in drug companies. Now, uh, of course, when a, when a, tr when a drug company or anybody does a trial, there's a consent procedure. Mm -hmm. And uh, many times I hear people referring to the consent as one of the barriers. So when you looked back at the consents that they had signed, were they in retrospect perhaps overly restrictive compared to what the patients would have agreed to? So we didn't actually look at the consents that these patients have signed. But having served on institutional review boards for clinical trials, I know that the practice has long been to assure participants that their data will only be viewed by members of the clinical trial team and certain people who are entitled to have disclosures made to them like government regulators. That clearly needs to change and is already beginning to change to contemplate uh, sharing of the data much more broadly, um, in part because I think uh, for scientists, the main reason has been because the journals require that as a condition of publication. Right. right. So just to step back a minute, um, um, 
let's let's go over why you would want to share this data. So uh, presuming that the, uh, the the drug, let's say the drug companies, although I know that this is also an issue for academic clinical trials as well, uh, presuming that they d d d disclose their findings and that we don't believe that there's fraudulent data going on, is this about checking to be, be sure that their calculations were correct or are there other unanticipated potential uses of this data? How should we think about the opportunity associated with these data if they were to be shared? So I think there are two main opportunities. One is along the lines of checking to make sure it's right. Interest in this area really began after the scandals um, about 10 years ago over Vioxx and a couple of other drugs where upon a second look at the data, it became apparent that the drug was actually a lot less safe than the pharmaceutical sponsor had let on. And in some cases, there were some pretty glaring statistical deficiencies in the work. And the feeling was if other scientists had had access to those data, we could have prevented harm to patients much earlier. Since then, um, there's a feeling that those practices have probably improved a bit, but there's a broader concern within science ab about the ability to replicate studies, the so-called replication crisis in science, where more and more it is being revealed that um, even good quality work by honest scientists often can't be replicated when others try for one reason or another. And um, and so this leads and to- And you a don't mean replicate as in reanalyze the data. You mean try to do the same type of trial with a new set of patients? Certainly that, but also just reanalyzing the okay. data. Sometimes okay. we we, we fail to reproduce the results. So again, there's a feeling that if these data were more broadly available, it might lead to greater confidence in the in the results that the public's relying on and, and maybe better practices in terms of statistical analysis and reporting. So that's one group of uses. But the second and maybe more exciting group of uses for patients has to do with exploring new questions. Um, pooling data across clinical trials, for example, to do more analyses of subgroups that were too small in any one trial to really learn anything about them. Um, or pooling data across trials to learn about rare conditions mm -hmm. that aren't possible to explore in a deep way in any one trial. Um, so it's the prospect of accelerating scientific discovery by making use of what we already have. Now, when you talk to these folks, and I think you said 92% were pretty pretty okay with it, 82% and even more were generally okay, um, were they, did they understand uh, how restrictive the data agreements that they participated in were? And were they surprised that these things were not happening? Or did they not find that surprising? Or did you even address that issue? We didn't ask that directly. But um, interestingly, we did give them op an opportunity to just write in comments at the end of the survey. And over and over, we heard things like, of course, they should be shared. If you don't like that, you shouldn't be participating in clinical huh. trials in the first place. That's what I'm here for. Um, so you know, that reminds us that in some sense, this is maybe a select group. These are already vo research volunteers. And if you're a person who's really um, wants to keep your data close to the chest, you probably don't volunteer for a trial in the first place. But given that you are a research participant, um, I don't think it came um, as much of a surprise to them that scientists would want to make maximal use of their data. And indeed, one of the most important functions of data sharing for them was making sure that their own sacrifice as a research participant led to some good. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Professor Michelle Mello about uh, data sharing of clinical trials and patient attitudes towards it. So what about, um, let's go down to the, the nuts and bolts of sharing. So you can just put it on the web and let people download it, but there must be other levels of security. And I'm wondering particularly the different entities and if we if they should all be treated the same. And let me just be specific. So you said a pharmaceutical company runs a trial and they have some data. They could share it with academic researchers and there's the patients might have some uh, re response to that idea. They could also share it with other companies, either in the health space, but increasingly we know that these big tech companies that are not traditionally associated with being in the tech space also may have interest in health as like a, uh, a new market for them. So what is the landscape of, of how sharing does work and perhaps how should it work? Well, here we're beginning, I think, to step out of the specific context of clinical trials because the issue you raise affects every single one of us as yeah. patients. Our data have long been shared with a variety of companies without really our express permission, um, but they're being shared in new ways and specifically more often with identifiers attached to them and um, more often in de-identified form with companies that are making radically new use of them, particularly for the development of artificial intelligence in medicine. Right. So now help me, I just want to make sure that we don't um, get confused. I, I, um, 
the first part of our conversation was about companies saying we don't want to share the data. We have all these agreements that we won't share it. But that now we're, you're also pointing out that there's often, uh, for healthcare in general, broad sharing. So what are the differences and why do those two seemingly opposite um, situations? Why are they both yeah. happening at the same time? Good question. Well, in the first context, the the situation is a, a drug company is trying to develop something new that it can sell and make a great deal of money on. So, of course, it wants to preclude competitors right. from figuring out what it's doing. They're racing to get to the patent office first, and its interest is in not sharing data with competitors, at least until it has obtained patents around the world. In the second instance, the, the data suppliers that we're talking about are mostly not drug companies. It's mostly hospitals, universities like Stanford and others around the world that um, are, have some, have the one thing that tech companies can never beat them at, which is access to patients. So I they see. tech companies may be better than you and I at data analysis and analytics, although probably not better than you, Russ. Oh, they're very uh, good. <laughs> but they will never have access to patients, and so they need hospitals ah. and healthcare organizations. And the question is, what's in it for the healthcare organizations? The answer may be money, but it may also be the development of new technologies that can help patients. So, so somebody listening to this might be very surprised to know that their data from a recent hospital visit may have been sold. Uh, should people assume that that's the case, or are there protections? Uh, you know, we every year we get piles and piles of mails about all the different companies that are so worried about our privacy that they're sending us email and hard copy mail, uh, you know, outlining all the processes they undergo. But so what do you tell somebody um, about the inherent privacy of their medical data at a hospital or at a clinic? Well, it may well not have been sold, but it has very likely been shared. And again, ah. that has always been the case because hospitals have always needed the help of third-party companies to do business, billing companies, process patient bills, supplier companies, and so forth. And so the law, our federal uh, privacy statute called HIPAA, allows those relationships to form pursuant to, to contracts called business associate agreements. And once you have one of those contracts in place, you can transfer patient data with names and all kinds of other information attached. And the idea is this is you know how we make health care organizations run. And so this is definitely facilitating care in a way that is reasonable and defensible. That's right. And what's novel um, is uh, it's two things that kind of maybe sit outside the intent of that federal privacy statute. One is the sharing of de-identified data. So as long as you strip out a bunch of information about us as patients, um, th that data set's no longer covered by HIP and you can do with it whatever you like. Um, we know, however, that it's increasingly easy to re-identify patients now with the computing capabilities that we have, and HIPAA simply didn't anticipate that problem. The second thing that's novel is the use of these business associate agreements for all kinds of new partnerships mm -hmm. um, aimed not at just processing bills or studying efficiency within the hospital, but of developing new kinds of products and algorithms that might improve care. And so there's a gray area there where we're slipping out of routine business use to new opportunities. And this might be with novel companies that are not traditionally in the healthcare business and may have a different sensibility about patients and what the... Uh, business opportunities are. Yeah, I think that's one way of looking at it. You know, healthcare organizations may view things differently and say, look, we have always been in the quality improvement business, and this is just a 21st century form of that. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Professor Michelle Mello. Uh, we're getting a little bit into uh, privacy rules, and you mentioned the, the HIPAA Act, which is a, an act in the U.S. Um, governing this, and I'm, I'm not sure we want to go into the details of that, although I'm sure it's fascinating. But what has also come to a lot of people's attention is that Europe has in introduced similar, but I think more strong legislation, and there's mumblings about similar things coming out at the state level, including California. So what? how rapidly changing is the um, the regulatory and governmental approach towards patient privacy, and, and really individual privacy? It goes beyond health records. I think it's beginning to change. Um, you know, the Europeans, as in most things, are ahead of us in terms of anticipating social needs and responding to them uh, with regulation. Um, but here in California, too, we've begun to evolve our law. Um, a new statute called the CCPA was passed in 2018, um, and it uh, gives consumers uh, the right to own their data and to opt out of various uses of their data by other companies and to know the uses to which their consumer data are put. It only applies to large companies and companies that make a lot of 
use of patient data. But it still uh, is kind of a paradigm shift from the old world in which if you as a business collect data, that data, uh, th- those are yours to do with yes. you as you wish. Um, what we haven't seen a lot of movement in is um, at the federal level, changing HIPAA, for example. There have been some kind of tweaks and clarifications, but um, I think the momentum for a federal privacy statute is, ju- is just sort of beginning to bud. So what do you tell uh, – you, you mentioned something about uh, increasing move towards uh, patient uh, ownership. I, I'm sure people are still confused about this. Who Do I own my medical records? Can I request a copy of them? Is that the same as ownership? Mm-hmm. Uh, and how clear is the law about those types of issues? Because I think that especially um, in independent America, we like to think that this is our data and we can control it. To what degree is that true? Well, HIPAA is very clear about that. And, you know, what happens when a state comes in with a law that says something different can be tricky. Uh, But, you know, in general, your healthcare providers are the owners of your data, but you have an absolute right to access them. And you might have to pay five bucks for your copies, but you're, you're... meant to be able to get them without any interference. Now, in practice, we know that healthcare providers all the time throw up the word HIPAA as a reason right. not to provide patients with information or to make them jump through all kinds of hoops. And it's mostly out of ignorance from low-level people within those organizations that are responding to these requests. So there's a certain institutional, perhaps, inertia or obstruction, whether on purpose or not, that makes it difficult sometimes to get this data. But you should be able to get it. You should be able to. Um, so... I want to go next to this idea of, um, and I know you've published about this, uh, the advertising uh, by the pharmaceutical industry. It's a little bit of a switch, but let's say they do their clinical trials, they either share their data or they don't share their data, and then there's an issue of their role in advertising uh, drugs. And as as I'm sure many people know, for many years this was not a lot at all, but now every morning on the morning news you can see lots of commercials. What is the situation with that and how fluid is it? So um, we and New Zealand are the only industrialized countries in the world that allow direct-to-consumer advertising of drugs. Of course, um, everybody allows advertising to physicians, and that's still the most important form of advertising that drug companies do. But as we all know, because we watch television, there's a lot of direct-to-consumer advertising. It's about a $6 billion a year industry, and it works. It drives me crazy. As a physician, I must say, every morning I'm shouting at the TV because they say, ask your doctor if you have, and then they list these incredibly technical things, which it is precisely, no, they say, tell your doctor. And it's like, this is the doctor's job to know. And so it just irritates me. But um, Well, a lot of physicians feel that way because they're already dealing with the constraints of a 15-minute office visit, and now some of that has to be devoted to explaining to the patient why they shouldn't have expensive advertised drug acts instead of an older generic alternative. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. More with Professor Michelle Mello about uh, direct-to-consumer advertising and other health and legal interactions next on Sirius XM. Welcome back to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Professor Michelle Mello from Stanford University. And we were just starting to talk about this odd, uh, at least it's odd, um, except for New Zealand and the, and the United States, uh, idea of directly advertising medications and medical devices uh, to patients. So um, why did that change happen? And is there any data suggesting it was a good idea, bad idea, or that everybody just ignores it and goes to their physician and talks about whatever they want to talk about? Well, drug companies were really pressing on the um, FDA and Congress to allow this because uh, uh, of two things that were going on. One is um, really a feeling that they needed another way to get information out there. Um, and the second was, in my view, increasing signals from the court that so-called commercial speech, speech about products and services that someone would like to sell you, um, enjoys First Amendment protection and that restrictions on it would be unlikely to survive legal challenge. I think those two forces together led to reconsideration of the traditional ban. And and I guess it's been 15, 20 years. It's been a while now, yeah. Um, Do we know if it has, uh, they continue to do it, so I'm going to assume that it has worked out financially for them, and I'm I'm sure they pay attention to this. Yeah, we know it works, and they know it works. Uh, It it has both beneficial and deleterious effects. The benefits are um, that it alerts patients to symptoms that they may not be aware have a treatment available now, in my view. That's a benefit that had more um, importance in the pre 
pre-internet era than it does today when we can all type in our symptoms right. and get a range of medical information and, and treatment opportunities pushed right out to us. Um, the deleterious effects uh, have to do with uh, encouraging patients to get on to expensive branded, meaning on patent drugs, where there are other alternatives available that have been in use longer and are much cheaper and probably as effective. And although this began as a radio and television thing, because that's what we had available, uh, I think we all see these now. Direct-to-consumer includes internet and social media. Are there special considerations? in um, Because then you could imagine that the search algorithms will target patients who are do doing certain kinds of searches. It could be very precise, the, the marketing. This could be a good thing, because it could get the news to the precisely the people who need it. Um, uh, What's your sense of that? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, legally, there's nothing particularly special about it. But yes, we're moving into a world where when you post on Facebook about your gout acting up, you are going to get advertisements for gout-related products and services. And that, uh, you know, it like many other forms of targeted advertising, just has a creepy factor for a lot of people. So um, th so this leads to the, uh, this, and, and as at, right before the break, you actually mentioned that people are now coming in saying, hey, why aren't I on this drug, Mr. Doctor or Ms. Ms. Doctor? Uh, and then the question is, um, is this, is there any evidence that this is causing problems in the pa patient-physician relationship? Uh, I think you mentioned that they have the physicians have a very short time. They uh, want to address the real problems of the patient. They are usually perfectly aware of all the medical choices that they have. Um, so, uh, ha and I know you've written about physician, uh, patient trust in physicians. Is that come into the dynamic, or is it mostly about other things? You know, I think it's, it, my sense is, and you probably know better as a as a clinical physician, is that it's mostly about time pressure. And, you know, how the physician would choose to allocate yeah. the scarce minutes available in an office visit versus what's on the patient's priority list um, when you're already rushed through a visit to have to explain why the, the greatest and greatest, newest and greatest drug is, is not better than what the patient has been taking at a fraction of the price. That, that's probably not great for the physician. Yeah. And there is an insidious, uh, in some types of uh, medical care, there's a terrible tradition that the interaction is not over until the physician writes on a little piece of paper or types in the computer, I'm going to give you this medication. And that's like a sign that the visit is over. And that's not very good because that's not a good way to mm. to have to end the interaction. It, in fact, it would be even better to say, the good news is I don't need to write you a prescription and we're not going to add any pills to your mornings and evenings. But that's not uh, the case. So this issue of uh, advertising and um, really, I think, plays right into a very hot topic, which is the uh, affordability of medications. And I know you've also written about that. Uh, from, a, from, a, from a legal perspective, as you approach these issues, what are the issues about uh, affordability? And, and has there been any progress in trying to think about new ways to, uh, to price drugs? Uh, we all know that we're not allowed, I think, we're not allowed to go to Canada to get our drugs. Um, so where are we? There's been a huge amount of thinking about what to do about this issue. It was, um, as of two years ago, maybe one of the only issues where there was broad bipartisan agreement. I mean, we're talking about a Congress that can't agree on whether the planet's warming, right? But they <laughs> they agreed that something had to be done about this issue. And so there really has been a very intense amount of work, both within the Congress, within the agencies, and outside in universities and other places. And lots of, of great and interesting ideas on the table now, not much progress yet. So can you tell me what are the fundamental tensions? I mean, I, I think a simple-minded would be, well, the drug companies want to make as much money as possible, uh, and other people want to pay as little as possible. But it, it, there are issues I know of um, incentivizing innovation for new drugs. There have been in the last few years the uh, the introduction of truly amazing drugs. Uh, two examples would be we ha now have for many people with hepatitis C, we have a perfectly good a curative agent, uh, which is priced in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's at one end of the extreme for a pretty common disease, hepatitis C. At another extreme, there are these very rare childhood diseases that are fatal, where we now have million dollar treatments. Uh, I, I've heard people say that society will go bankrupt if the drug companies continue being this creative and successful in creating treatments. So is it a, what is the set of more sophisticated considerations to create an ecosystem that really works? So the, the central trade-off or tension that you're raising here is between um, innovation and affordability or between um, affordability and availability. Right. Yeah. So uh, 
there's no doubt that at some level this this has to be right, that if you eliminate uh, financial incentives to develop new drugs, for-profit companies and the investors that back them are not going to be interested in pouring as much money into it. The problem is we don't really know how to quantify that trade-off. When when a drug company says, oh, you know, you can't possibly reduce my margins or, or you know, all innovation will cease, that doesn't seem plausible. But I can't give you like a beta coefficient. Right. If you reduce profits by this much, we'll see this much less innovation. And then the other problem is, even if I could, you and I might not agree about what we'd be willing to trade off. So I might say, I'd give up three new drugs a year if it meant that every American could access the ones you have, and you might disagree. So we've got both an empirical problem and a normative problem. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Professor Michelle Mello now about drug prices. and, and uh, so, so this is a hard problem. Uh, is, does anybody take it as their problem to solve? So uh, you pointed that Congress, is it basically an act of Congress or are there other uh, more subtle ways that, uh, I don't know, the FDA or other federal agencies underneath the Congress could make progress in this area? I think everybody could make progress in this area. If we want very large changes to the way our federal programs pay for and acquire drugs, it will take an act of Congress, usually. Um, but there is a lot that can be done through administrative regulation within the FDA, changing the way drugs get approved, how much that costs, and so forth, within the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, what types of experiments they allow, and so forth. I think it's also important to note that there's a lot that can be done without law. Um, you know, For example, one of the most important problems, in my view, is that at the point of prescribing, physicians have very little information about the relative costs of the different drug choices that they have available. Yes, and particularly how much it's going to cost that specific patient exactly. because of their insurance. Because as you know, there's not just one price for drug. Everybody pays a different price depending on who their insurer is and what kind of plan they have from that insurer. So one thing that the market has begun to supply is um, products within the electronic health record that can tell a physician, Here are the, here's the choice set, here's what it'll cost your patient today, and here's what it would cost their health plan today. And that could become part of the prescribing conversation. And as a physician, I, I would be happy to have that information, and I am positive it would increase the quality of my relationships with my patients if they were on board with the idea that I was making these decisions not only to optimize their care, but also to minimize the impact on their wallet. You know, physicians, I think, are often reluctant to bring cost into the conversation, in part uh, still feeling the sting of the managed par- care backlash from the mm-hmm. 1990s, where they felt like they were under attack personally for not having their patients' interests at heart. But survey evidence tells us patients want cost to be part of this conversation. They want physicians to acknowledge that that is a real barrier for a lot of them accessing medication. Thank you for listening to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. If you missed any of this episode, listen anytime on demand with the SiriusXM app.